Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program for Seeds of Something Different. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Hello and welcome to the second in the series of programs, a history, UC Santa Cruz, A History of Creativity and Change. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. I didn't unmute myself. I apologize. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining us in the second of our six part series, UC Santa Cruz, A History of Creativity and Change. Thank you all for joining us today. We are thrilled to have such interest in this program. My name is Teresa Mora and I am the head of Special Collections and Archives here at UC Santa Cruz. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about the event this afternoon. We are using a webinar tool today, so you will not be able to use chat during the program. Instead, we invite you to submit any questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the program. Of course, we do have a large audience today, and we unfortunately will not be able to address every question. However, we will do our best. 
To that end, the panelists have agreed to stay on to continue to take questions for an additional 15 minutes after the formal end of the program at 6 p.m. We do ask the audience to limit your questions to the period covered in today's program. Opportunity to discuss later decades at UC Santa Cruz will be given, but later in the series. Additionally, for those of you who are, wish to contribute your own memories of UC Santa Cruz, we encourage you to contribute content to our online exhibit, which you can view at the website listed on this slide, which I think we're about to share. Um, and we've also sh just shared uh, that link in chat. We will be sharing other links throughout the program where you can find more information about SEEDS and the history of UC Santa Cruz. Also, please do know that this event is being recorded and that the recording will be made available at the link that has just been posted in chat. The recording of last week's session has already been published at that site. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon as we delve into the 1970s at UC Santa Cruz. Welcome back to those of you who joined us last week and welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. We are eager to share a bit of seeds of something different with you all. Our reading today will give you the opportunity to hear the stories and the first person accounts of those who experienced that tumultuous time at UC Santa Cruz and to reflect on how the period shaped the campus. The editors have also prepared a selection of images from the period being covered today to share while they read, to provide a taste of the rich visual material included in the seeds book and held in the archives at UC Santa Cruz. To see more images at your leisure, you can visit the link that we'll, we are about to post into chat. We have divided the programming today into two sections organized topically, and we have reserved two periods for questions after each section ends. Joining us today are the editors of Seeds, Irene Retty, Sarah Rabkin, and Cameron Vanderskop. Irene Retty graduated from UC Santa Cruz with a BA in Environmental Studies in 1982 and earned her Master's in History from UC Santa Cruz in 2004. She currently serves as the Director of the Regional History Project, which she has worked for since 1989. Sarah Rabkin received her graduate degree in Science Communication from UC Santa Cruz in 1983. In addition to working as a consulting consultant for the Regional History Project, she has worked as a member of the UCSC Writing Faculty and taught in the Environmental Studies Department. Cameron Vanderskoff is also a UC Santa Cruz alum, earning his bachelor degrees in both history and literature with a concentration in creative writing in 2011. Based in New York City, Cameron works as a consulting oral historian. Joining the editors today will be special guest commentators, Professors Olga Mejera Ramirez and J. Herman Blake. With that, I will turn the program over to Irene. Thank you, Teresa. It's been my honor as director of the Regional History Project to spend more than 30 years learning how to listen as I've done oral history interviews with students, faculty, staff, and administrators who've given their lives to building UC Santa Cruz. The oral history program itself has actually existed um, since 1963, two years before the campus even opened its doors. And Library Special Collections has been archiving campus photographs, posters, and other ephemera all of that time as well. A bit of backstory for this book, Seeds of Something Different, for anyone who was not able to join us last week. What happened was over time, I, as the director, realized that not enough people know about the oral histories or the images and other archives that we have at Special Collections. And a lot of people were coming to me and saying, how do I find out about the history of the campus? And telling them to go read 40,000 pages of transcript was just not really a great option. So five years ago, I had the idea of creating a book that would weave together a collage of excerpts from the oral histories and a selection of images and put that all together in one place. So that thus came together seeds of something different with my amazing colleagues, 
Sarah Rabkin and Cameron Vanderskoff and I working for five years via Google Drive and telephone and in-person meetings with lots of soup and chips and other goodies to create the book that's before you today. So our aim was to both create a collection that would tell the story of UCSC, which is actually quite dramatic and complex and sometimes very emotional for many of us, and also to foreground these collections that you can um, go onto our website and explore. So the book came out in March, right as the pandemic was starting, and it's available at Bookshop and Bay Tree Bookstore, and we've been getting lots of great feedback about it. But we wanted to bring, uh, to take the time to go through each decade of the campus's history and bring together this amazing group of people in one place to talk about what has happened and how the place has evolved. Although we meet today on Zoom during a pandemic, gazing at each other on separate screens in isolated houses, we invite you to imagine today's event as a kind of story circle around a campfire in which you can really close your eyes and listen, or if you're more visual, you can listen and enjoy the images that we've put together for you today they are not meant to exactly sync with the words, but more to resonate with individual oral history passages. Last week at the first event in this series, more than 400 of us traveled back to the pioneering years of the campus to the scruffy nascent utopia where the first students lived in trailers in this wide open Western landscape. We listened to students and founding faculty members describe being swept up in the emerging counterculture of the 1960s, navigating the tumult and tragedy of the Vietnam War era. We heard directly from two of the characters featured in Seeds, former camp campus architect Frank Swart and founding faculty member Ed Landisman. And hello to Frank and Ed if you're here with us again, which I think they are. Welcome to all of our new community members tuning in and welcome back to everyone else who's making a return appearance. And we hope you'll continue to join us for this trip through UCSC's history. Today, we are honored to have as guest commentators two narrators from SEEDS, Dr. J. Herman Blake and Dr. Olga Nahara Ramirez. We thank them for joining us today. A few other thank yous are in order. Thank you to Teresa Mora and Jessica Pizza of Special Collections and Archives for their unstinting support as colleagues. To all of those at University Relations and Library Development who have worked very hard on all of the details involved in producing this Zoom series. Kristen Palma, Suze Howells, Melissa Weckerly, Diana Hogue, Linda Hunt, and Yoke Rubens. Thank you to my graduate fellow, Alessia Chiquette, who created the wonderful SEEDS exhibit website where you can upload your story. To all of our narrators and photographers, to the former directors of the Regional History Project, of which I'm only the third in 57 years, and to the interviewers and transcribers over the years for their labors, which are often unseen. The words we will hear today may resonate with particular intensity, dwelling as we do in excruciating and transformative times of national protest for long overdue, long denied racial justice and gender equity. As James Baldwin once wrote, quote, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. And now we return to the late 1960s. Dr. King is leading a civil rights and poor people's movement in America in what will be the final years of his life. There are mass uprisings and protests led by African-American activists in cities like Harlem, New York, Watts, Los Angeles, as well as Newark and Detroit, with the National Guard sent in to civilian neighborhoods. You see, Santa Cruz is not insulated from these sea changes. 
on campus, educators and students are pushing for change. Feminist consciousness is also emerging in a painfully male-dominated academy. This is the time of the visionary founding of Oaks College rooted in the collegiate ideals of the original UCSC, but animated by a drive to create, to borrow a phrase from Dr. King, a beloved community of multicultural students and faculty, one that emphasizes dialogue across racial, ethnic, and class difference and centers the teaching of writing and scientific literacy. Oak's vision of what we today would call intersectionality and racial justice is decades ahead of its time. But across all of UCSC, a tide of change is rising. A change is gonna come. Herman Blake, provost of Oaks College. We kept saying to faculty and the administration, a change is gonna come, a change is gonna come. Aretha Franklin used to sing that song, a change is gonna come. And I tried to get them to see, we'd say, look at the composition of the elementary schools in Los Angeles and San Francisco, that's your future. Glenn Omatsu, student. The courses that are taught here and the people who go here, the general perspective is entirely from a white viewpoint. The first thing that's going to have to be changed is that they're going to have to get more third world people on campus, particularly from the surrounding areas. Herman Blake. I'm the first black in the social sciences. There were Asians, but in terms of black and Latino and Native Americans, I'm the first one on the campus. I come the second year. Glenn Omatsu. I grew up in neighborhoods with heavy concentrations of ethnic populations. I went to East LA College. East LA College is about 50% Chicano, about 10% Negro, about 10% Asian American, and the rest would be white. When I came up here, it was a total reversal because the campus was entirely white. At that time, there were about two black students in Stevenson, maybe about two or three Chicanos, and a few Asian Americans. When I was first walking on campus, I had some kind of feeling of unhappiness. I couldn't really figure out why. As I look back on it now, I realize that this was the reason. Michael Cowan, professor of literature and American studies. Dean McHenry wanted to build a minority population at Santa Cruz, but this was a hard place to bring them, a small town, very little local Hispanic population, and it's working class. And this was a campus which was attracting upper middle class white kids initially and was seen not necessarily as a place which was going to be focused on jobs. So that working class population, which was an important part of the Hispanic population was not coming here. That was part of the issue. That population was growing system wide, but it was going to the urban campuses. It was going to the California State University campuses. It wasn't coming here. Glenn Omatsu. The people who come here are basically liberal, but if you start talking to people, or if they just start asking you questions on the situation of minority people in this country, you'll find certain things you didn't expect. Like one person, one person told my friend Ho, why are you minority people here at all? And why can't you just stay in your place? You know, in a way, do what you're told to do. You guys are here, you should be happy you're getting a first-rate education. Then he went on to tell Ho, if there were no minority students here at all, then this place would really be perfect. No trouble would be occurring at all. Evelyn Luluquizen, student. I apologize if I've mispronounced her name. Somehow the students of color got judged more. Why are they here? How did they get here? What do they want? You think you're gonna get a degree? You really think you're gonna get a degree? You think you can finish? Some of it was blatant. Richard Vasquez, student. I was 28 years old when I came to UC Santa Cruz in the fall of 1972. 
I was a transfer student from West Valley College over the hill in Saratoga, California. For most of us, I think for communities of low income or communities of color, John F. Kennedy was a sense of hope. He was a young president with young ideas, new ideas. That was taken away. Then a couple years later with Dr. King and his assassination, and then John Kennedy's brother, Robert F. Kennedy. That was like someone hitting you in the stomach, someone taking the wind out of you. And now what do I do? What do you do? It's nice to have those kinds of people, but the work really comes down to you. What are you gonna do? They may be the president and Dr. King might be a leader, but what is going to be your role? What are you going to do to make this a better society, a better country to live in? Michael James, student. It was 1970. We were pioneers of people of color in the academy. We are maybe the second generation of EOP students and middle-class students of color in the University of California system. There were 400 of us on campus. We were 10% of the entire student body. That's mixed Asian American, Latino, and African American. Glenn Omatsu. By far on most campuses, the push for educational reform has come from the blacks. And in California, it comes from the Blacks, the Chicanos, and the Asians. Olga Najera Ramirez, student. I entered UCSC in the fall of 1973. Merrill College was very lively. There were a lot of Chicanos. Merrill had a lot of Mexicanos. Crown, not so much. Stevenson, some. But Merrill was like a real place. That's where Mexican folkloric dance troupe Los Mexicas started. Michael James. When I got to UC Santa Cruz, that was two years after the ethnic studies rising at SF State. 1970, 71 was the late Vietnam War period. South African apartheid starts to emerge as an issue. It was definitely a post 60s moment. Leaders like Herman Blake and other faculty of color had penetrated the institutions. They have come out of the communities and are using the institutions as a launching pad for smaller initiatives in different parts of the world. The civil rights movement had peaked and ethnic studies was starting to happen. George Blumenthal, professor of astronomy. Before Oaks got started, there was a movement on campus for ethnic studies and the idea was to create a college to do it. Herman Blake. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Colleges and universities around the country turned to see what they could do. George Blumenthal. Once Herman Blake and Ralph Guzman got involved in the planning for Oaks, they wanted to create an environment, a multicultural environment. The goal was to make sure that the students who came to Oaks College, who were not just minority, but were truly multicultural, would have pathways to success. They would learn science, they would learn to write, they would learn to be successful, and to be as successful as anyone else, and maybe more successful than anyone else. Herman Blake. Ralph Guzman had come to campus. I was in Cowell and he came to be in Merrill. He was, I think, one of the first, if not the first Latino, at least in the social sciences faculty member. We were both in various ways engaged in Latino communities in the San Joaquin Valley. He from whatever he was doing with Latinos, me from whatever I was doing with poverty programs. We saw there were ways we could do some things and it became a way of opening up the university. So we agreed not only to collaborate, but to model. We made it our business to walk around the campus together. We made it our business too. each day when we were working together, eat lunch in the dining hall of a different college. We'd go to Merrill College or we'd go to Cowell College or Crown College. We just walk in and get a meal and sit down and eat, talking to each other, knowing we're being watched 
and knowing what they were seeing was a Latino and a black in cohort. What we were doing was focusing on a different set of intellectual challenges, political issues, and all of the like. In building Oaks College, we were thinking about building a college in which we would have a different student body, recruit different students, but not exclude anybody. Those who were already there and those who were traditionally coming would be part of it. And we would recruit particularly Latino and Black and Native American students. And I argued for poor whites, get them all. Diane Lewis, professor of anthropology. I'd been teaching at San Francisco State for about 10 years. It was a very tumultuous time. Students were demanding changes in the curriculum and teachers were going on strike. And there was a lot of divisiveness between minority and white students and between teachers on strike and those who were not. Students were being hauled off to jail. There was blood on the campus. Herman Blake came up to San Francisco State to give a talk. He was talking about this innovative new college that he and Ralph Guzman were starting, which was devoted to attracting non-traditional, underrepresented students and non-traditional faculty. Herman Blake. When it came time for the Academic Senate to vote for the academic program of Oaks College, there were key people who tried their best to keep that thing from happening. They used every avenue they could. But I had a kind of confidence that it was going to work. Diane Lewis, professor of anthropology, Herman had to fight for many of us. He never said it, but I think we were considered an experiment by other colleges. He protected us and fought for the college and for the concept because there were a lot of traditionalists they didn't like the idea of experimenting with new curricula and this whole idea of ethnic studies or feminist studies. None of that to them was legitimate. So it was a struggle. You're always fighting against the status quo and you're trying to establish something new or something more equitable, fair. Don Rothman lecturer in writing. In 1972, I first heard about Oaks College the first year that Oaks opened. Herman knew that since I was teaching writing at Merritt College in Oakland, working mostly with black students, working class people, that I'd be interested in Oaks. I needed a full-time job. I was committed to working with non-traditional students at the university. I was finding myself more and more interested in working with those people whose success was not guaranteed, for whom teaching made a difference, people who were not at all sure what was expected of them at the university and who would really value the efforts that I was willing to put into helping them learn how to write. Valerie Simmons, professor of psychology, I was affiliated with psychology and with Oaks College. I would go over to Oaks and teach the core course and laugh with Herman. It was the most wonderful experience teaching. We would actually sit down and talk about teaching, talk about what makes a difference for students. I never heard a word about anything like that in psychology, ever. Evelyn Lulukui's student. I started out at Cowell. Cowell was very traditional Greek, although it didn't have sororities or fraternities. My advisor and teacher for Western Civ Core course was trying to be more open to minorities, but he didn't know how. I mean, he tried. I felt out of place. 
I didn't have many friends at Cowell. I knew I felt out of place, so I wanted to go someplace different. Oaks College seemed to be a little more open. I thought I'd give it a try. I got in. I could have gone to Merrill, but I didn't like the dormitories at Merrill. I wanted something different. I found the classes at Oaks more interesting. I took a class with lecturer Kathy Cowan, a class called Literature of the Third World. We read Artemio Cruz, Zora Neale Hurston, maybe even Toni Morrison. I thought, oh, this is what I like. Okay, I can do this. We had a residential preceptor. Father, the husband, was a police officer for UC Santa Cruz. He was black, the wife was Korean, so I got to know her and she taught me how to make kimchi. Herman Blake wanted to make a community that was mixed, multicultural, people of different backgrounds and social class. It was an experiment and it worked because we all had to bump into each other. For students of color, Oaks was a safe haven. It was a place where we could be ourselves without being judged. Like, oh, how come you're acting like that? All you people just like loud music. Herman Blake, when we built Oaks College, we planted 700 daffodil bulbs. I did that because I knew the winters in Santa Cruz, the rain. Come springtime, the students had cabin fever and they wanted to get out. I wanted those flowers to blossom in a way that gave another vision, a view of the world. We had that meadow and the overview of the bay. Students wanted the bay view, so they put the academic building and the faculty offices up towards the woodsy side. And the students had the view in these apartments with the laundry place in between and the patios where they could gather and barbecue and do other kinds of things. We'd have gatherings on Friday evenings. The students would sit there and watch the sunset and applaud God. Yay, God! God! Evelyn Lou Cuisson. Oaks College was a community. All the minority students, we'd look at each other and go, you're here. You're here. Diane Lewis. Oaks was a very exciting place to be. These weren't the privileged students who were there because their parents wanted them to be there. They were there because they wanted to be, and they wanted to have a better life for themselves and their communities. I thought it was a privilege and an inspiration to be there. Don Rothman, lecturer in writing, the issues that we have rallied around at Oaks are the issues on which our survival depends. Oaks is a place where people have accepted struggle and there's never been any complacency. While that's difficult and we often feel beleaguered, our struggling opens us up, sensitizes us to the very real struggles of other people in the world. Herman Blake. We invited educator and civil rights activist Septima Clark to come and spend two different periods of time. Septima's vision and her approach were so broad that she not only visited, she started talking. She began to teach. She would say to the students, well, where are you on the Equal Rights Amendment? The students, some of them weren't doing any, anything, hadn't even thought about it. As they listened to her, they would say, she's been at this for 50 years. 50 years. We spend a semester or a year trying to do something. And if it doesn't change, we give up and we go on to something else. She's been at it for 50 years years. Don Rothman, the 
people I'm friendly with and feel close to at Oaks are committed very seriously to political and social change in the world. They don't see themselves as just scholars working on an abstract and theoretical level with important problems. Ultimately, they have accepted the responsibility for being in the world to try to improve it. Herman Blake, I always said to the students, when, when you get to the table and you know that you're a full part of the process, the institution where you've been denied in the past, don't just feel good about having succeeded. Think about who's not there. Always ask yourself the question, who's not here? So that's the first part of our reading, everyone. Um, and uh, we're going to now uh, pan out to a very uh, quick uh, initial Q&A followed by another reading. But first, um, I do want to introduce our wonderful uh, commentators who we are so happy to have here with us. Uh, so first, just to say a bit more, uh, Dr. Olga Najera Ramirez grew up in Davenport near Santa Cruz. She attended UCSC as an undergraduate student, then returned as assistant professor. She arrived as a Merrill College student in 1973 danced with the troupe Grupo Folclorico Los Mexicas and earned a dual degree in history and Latin American studies in 1977. She was a professor in the anthropology department from 1989 until her retirement in 2015. Nahara Ramirez participated in establishing UCSC's Latin American and Latino Studies Department and she co-founded and has directed the Chicano Latino Research Center, now called the Research Center for the Americas. Since 1996, she has provided faculty advising to Los Mexicas. And then we also have with us Dr. J. Herman Blake, who arrived at Santa Cruz in 1966 as a member of Cowell College and a professor of sociology. He was the first African-American faculty member at UCSC. Dr. Blake remained on the campus for 18 years. He is beloved at the campus both as a charismatic, rigorous, and brilliant teacher mentor, and as the visionary leader who founded UCSC Seventh College Oaks and served as its first provost. Um, so uh, I'm now going to look into our, um, our, our question and answer. Uh, so we have, um, so let's see, so we have one question for Dr. Blake uh, with warm regards from the current occupant of the J. Herman Blake Provost House. Um, so, uh, and the question, Herman, is, I was interested to hear about the vision of Oaks College as initially an ethnic studies college. Over the years, as the college system changed and became more distant from departmental curricula, I think this turn, this possibility turned into more of an identity for the college. With the establishment of the critical race and ethnic studies major and the recently announced black studies minor, what do you think would help the college return to this founding idea? What is your vision for Oaks now? That's the question, Herman. Thank you, Cameron, and thank you for that question. I can't say that I can articulate a vision for contemporary Oaks College. I would argue that has to come from the students and the faculty and also from the leadership of the campus. There's got to be a commitment far beyond words. And in my opinion, that commitment has to be financial in terms of budget support and administrative in terms of helping to work through the, in, in, the inner workings of the university. 
I would argue that coming out of where you are, you have to make that decision and make those changes or require or recruit the support for those changes. I left Santa Cruz in 1984. That's over 30 years ago. And even though I have very fond memories, one of the things I have tried not to do is to use my experience and my vision as a model for what should be today. I hope that's all right. Thank you, Herman. Um, and uh, so we have a question here from uh, Nirupama Chandrasekhar, who is uh, a current undergraduate at UCSC. Um, so uh, so uh, the question uh, for Olga is, uh, specifically for Ms. Nahara Ramirez, I loved reading your perspectives in the book. I was curious about what you felt contributed to the wonderful success of Folkloricos Los Mexicas as a dance group on campus. The arts are always underfunded, especially more ethnic arts, and it's a wonderful accomplishment. I was really curious about what sorts of community engagement and support helped its longevity as a dance and arts group. So that's the question for you. Okay. Well, first of all, the group was established by students. We didn't have a lot of support, uh, you know, from the departments or from the division, and we were never affiliated with the arts until recently, which has been a fabulous thing. Um, I think what it had several, there were several things going on. One is that it provided a community for people to come together who were interested in learning about Mexican culture. And it didn't, you did not have to be um, Chicano, Latino. In fact, you didn't even have to know how to dance. They, we taught each other. So that was a wonderful thing. It was very open. We could speak Spanish, we could hear music, and it really became like family. Um, but we actually um, were not considered, we didn't consider ourselves like a real performing group for, you know, big stages. We were really interested in uh, sharing what we knew to local uh, community, especially at that time, bilingual education was sort of an emerging thing and uh, local teachers wanted to know more about Mexican culture. So uh, we would go out and do these uh, presentations. We would do in-service workshops. Mind you, we didn't know that much, but we still knew a little bit more than, than you know, somebody who wasn't involved at all. Um, we ended up doing a lot of outreach through our group. We would go to the hometowns of many of the participants, you know, their old high schools, and we'd perform there. And then we would talk to the students about, hey, you know, you guys can come to UCSC too. And, uh, so we made those linkages. Uh, we performed here in Santa Cruz. I remember uh, we, or I thought, you know, there should be something here in Santa Cruz because we get forgotten. <laughs> so I organized the, um, a presentation at Santa Cruz High, my old high school, and all the local people went. They hadn't seen this, so it was really marvelous. I think uh, that, and then also by having that community, we um, served the purpose of retention. A lot of students were very lonely. UCSC was very different from their home environments, and once they came to the university, and if they joined uh, the dance group, you know, they felt like they had a home. They have, they had an extra family. So that was really nice. I think those were uh, important things about the dance group. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Olga, um, and to both our commentators. So uh, we're now going to segue back into a final reading section, and then we will return to our fabulous commentators uh, for their commenting. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to uh, my colleague, Irene, uh, to read. Uh, our closing uh, section of uh, excerpts for the day. A male academic locker room. Ronnie Grun, professor of politics. In the early days, it was a very homogenous campus. Most of the students were white. They were upper middle class in terms of income and it was an essentially male institution. There were very few women strewn around the faculty. Some of them were told they weren't going to get tenure 
and they left, and they probably wouldn't have gotten tenure. A few of us stayed. Michael Cowan, professor of literature and dean of humanities. Dean McHenry and Paige Smith both claimed, and I think they were both sincere about this, that they very much wanted to hire women at the outset. The use of networks rather than open searches inhibited that. If you were looking for people at Harvard and Yale and Princeton, you're not going to find any women. Hayden White, professor of history of consciousness. These guys were really very conservative people, many of whom, though, had disdain for a bourgeois commercial consumerist culture. They wanted something that represented quality, and quality for them meant the Ivy League, Oxford, Cambridge, English gentleman, the guy who's a physicist in the day and plays the cello in his quartet in the evening and then writes his novel on the weekends. Patricia Dorsey Bassett, researcher. The 1965 to 1975 academic plan for UCSC specifically recognized a special need for women faculty members and suggested tapping, quote, a large reservoir of trained and partially trained women scholars whose roles as wife and mother have become less demanding and who could be persuaded to return to part or full-time teaching. Hal Hyde, Vice Chancellor. Dean McHenry's attitude was pro-hiring women faculty and he encouraged Mary Holmes and Cowell. There were very, very few women in the initial appointments there wasn't a big pool out there. Ronnie Groom. There was the idea that Stevenson was this male bastion, that it was the worst college in the system. Well, yes and no. There was Glenn Wilson, who was very staid. But part of it had to do with the time frame when people were hired. It was a lot easier later with the newer colleges to hire 50-50 faculty in terms of gender. Stevenson would have had to get rid of half of its faculty to become 50-50. It wasn't that the male faculty in Stevenson were any more sexist than the male faculty in other colleges. When the boys in Stevenson played poker on Tuesday night, they certainly didn't invite me, but then I don't play poker anyway. They were chaps getting together Sometimes at parties, some fairly eminent faculty members and people in administration would have a few drinks. I remember one person who was an administrator who said to somebody at a party, and I overheard it, he said, well, I know we have to have these women, but in any event, they're all lesbians. Now, there's nothing wrong with somebody being a lesbian, but it just simply wasn't true. Alan Sable professor of sociology. I wasn't part of the behind the scenes machinations that go on in the faculty. I was excluded from that, I think partly because of being gay. Even my straight faculty colleagues and friends were somewhat distant from me, more distant than they might be with a straight colleague because I didn't have a wife and have them and their wives over for dinner and so forth. It was largely men who were married who had the power in the university at that time, straight men. There were a few junior faculty who were women. Actually, most of the people I was closest to on the faculty were women, but they had very little power because they didn't have tenure either. So that was kind of a, a kind of handicap. I wasn't one of the boys as I might have been if I had been a straight man. Kathy Olson, Assistant Director of the Women's Center. Here's an interesting issue about the history of women at UC Santa Cruz. Because of the particular and special function of the colleges as social institutions 
for each group who was at that college, there was a lot of socializing going on at the provost's houses. And it was absolutely assumed and taken for granted that it had to be a male provost and he had to have a wife who was good at organizing social events. I mean, that was just part of the protocol. Somebody got a divorce. He had to leave the provostship because he had to have a wife there to take care of managing the provost's house. William Rose. My father, Jasper Rose, used to have Shakespeare readings in the house, which was fun. He used that house to entertain. He got my mother to do a lot of entertaining too, probably more than she should have had to do. They both threw themselves into the role of being provost and provost's wife at the social level. They both wanted to make it dynamic. It was unpaid, really, that, abs that aspect. They had lots and lots of parties for everyone. My mother used to cook huge meals. She'd cook a chicken curry or something for 150 people, and she'd have a couple of students help her. They'd have all the stoves going, huge buckets of the stuff at very good quality. It was quite impressive. Hal Hyde, Vice Chancellor. Then there was a shift in the world. And I've known a few old bears in the woods who thought things should not change, at Cal Berkeley particularly. But as far as I was concerned, Let's grab hold and go on, even if I didn't understand it completely. But I was kind of on the fringe when this shift happened. My assistant was Elizabeth Pinot, who later became vice chancellor of UCSC. She was very knowledgeable in this issue and shared with me some of her experiences with chauvinistic administrators at Systemwide. Helene Moglin, Dean of Humanities. I think as a woman dean, there is no way that I was not treated more harshly, more unforgivingly. I encountered all kinds of misogyny. The anger about me was often very deep. And this came from men as well as women. I was the first female dean in the UC system and I think I may have been the first female administrator in the UC system. When I used to go to the all university meetings, people would ask me to get them coffee. I would make jokes, but it got to you. It was very much of a men's club. The few women who were tenured here were scattered all over the campus. My support structure was largely the senior men whom I hired. As women came gradually, I did have more and more of a support system, but not at the beginning. There were very few feminists. There were very few women on the campus. I had the first meeting of tenured women at UCSC. There were 20 of us. I had them to the provost's house at Kresge. And that means associate and full professors. It was the first time they had ever been in a room together and had ever identified themselves as the tenured women at UCSC. So when I keep saying the guys, it's not just my paranoia. There really were very few women. Tilly Shaw, professor of literature. I remember also getting really crazily angry for a stretch of time. That was rather hard. I was suddenly picking up on a whole series of male signals that I had lived fairly obliviously with for a long time. I remember having conversations with certain particularly obtuse men. I would offer to explain what the situation was like for me as a woman. Every time I would start to say something, I'd get rebutted. They weren't able to hear me out. It wasn't even ideas about men and women so much. It was ideas about the academy. 
I didn't know where to turn. Men were often poor listeners, incurious, whereas I grew righteous, having had to devote so much of my life to male literature. Ronnie Groon. One of the things that people started recognizing in the 70s was that you got to do something about women. So eventually, more women got hired. Eventually, some ethnic minority women got hired. Tilly Shaw, professor. I always had a craving for more contact with women, but I was shut into a male academic locker room, listening to conversations between men about women. That was an alienated time for me, the underside of some really good things that happened. Carolyn Martin Shaw, professor of anthropology. I got the job offer at UCSC and it was for $9,900 for the year which I thought was great. Rich Randolph, who was chair of anthropology at the time, said, you're supposed to bargain. It is common for women to not negotiate, to feel, oh, I'm lucky to have a job offer. Men were more likely to be negotiating and more likely to want more money. And they were more likely to be offered more money. Tilly Shaw. So it was wonderful when the women's movement happened to see more women in the public domain and watch how they handled all sorts of things and what they had to say. Suddenly the world was full of information about women's lives. There were very fine papers on the generic he, which I stopped using. There were regular research presentations interest in women's theater and women's poetry readings. Courses started coming into the curriculum. I think of it all as simultaneously, simultaneous with the development of affirmative action. We were beginning to be concerned about equity, equity within our own system, and then in the larger University of California. We were sort of publicly aware like Barbara Walters, of trying to push against the glass ceiling, Harry Reasoner not wanting to work with Barbara Walters, all these problems that women faced, all of this was in the air. Thank you, Irene. Um, so, uh, at this point in our program, uh, we are going to pivot uh, to our two commentators, uh, Herman and Olga. And I don't know if you have a preference for who goes first. Um, Olga, would you like to lead off? Yes. So um, I understood my role to be to talk about the script, about what has been read, and um, talk around it in a way. And so I thought that it would help um, to contextualize a little bit what it was like for Santa Cruz to see the establishment of UCSC. Um, Santa Cruz was a fairly, I would say, um, conservative town, tourist place. And I grew up along the coast and came to Santa Cruz High. Um, when the university established itself, uh, it did feel like a city on the hill because we didn't really engage with the students or faculty uh, very much as residents. Um, I was, um, at the time, there were not very many Mexicans in Santa Cruz. I mean, you couldn't find a Mexican store, nothing. So we had to go elsewhere for that um, food. But anyway, um, going to Santa Cruz High, there was a small population and we really knew each other more uh, socially through baptisms and weddings, but there really wasn't a critical mass at the, at, in Santa Cruz. But um, anyway, when I came to uh, make my decision to go to college, I did not have 
permission to go anywhere <laughs> outside of Santa Cruz. So it was Santa Cruz, uh, UCSC, or Cabrillo, according to my mom. And I really was excited about going to LA or to Berkeley because there was so much activism and everything. There was activism on, uh, at UCSC. I do remember uh, students protesting and marching and boycotting a Safeway and things like that. And um, the only way in which I engaged with UCSC students prior to entering was that some of the students would do field projects and go to uh, outlying communities and they came to Davenport. So I got to meet some of them. Um, but I just didn't feel like I fit. Um, the, as everybody has mentioned several times, you know, it was really a, a very middle class white uh, institution. And I just didn't think that was the place for me, but I didn't have much option. And then to add insult to injury, my high school counselor was very uh, patronizing and he thought that all minorities uh, should just go to Cabrillo. Like he didn't want to encourage us to do any further. And I had done the college track, so I was very upset and insulted. He said, why don't you just go to Cabrillo and become a secretary? Well, that was not my dream. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, anyway, so almost in spite of his <clears throat> behavior, uh, I decided to enroll at UCSC and I was happy to get in there. When I got there, I remember being invited to an EOP orientation and I didn't even know what EOP was. So I thought, I'll go. I went and I remember going to one of the classroom units at the smaller of the two. And to me, it was a huge number of people of color. I thought, wow, I've never seen this many. <laughs> this many people of color and it was actually comforting I thought hey maybe there's there is will be room for me you know and I, that's when I found out that a lot of the students had heard about Santa Cruz because UCSC was doing a lot of outreach but they were going to the San Joaquin Valley they were going to LA they were even going to Watsonville but I think because we were so few in Santa Cruz they didn't think well let's look what's happening in town and so anyway, it was, it was sort of empowering to see that there were some changes already happening that were positive through the efforts of like affirmative action and all the people who were fighting for um, uh, social equality. Um, anyway, so it was, that was a really um, wonderful thing. But I found out more wonderful things about Santa Cruz. Um, my goal was to become an educator. I was thinking elementary or high school. And um, I really liked my professors. They were teaching wonderful classes. And, um, you know, I bonded with a lot of them. And the, at that time, I think it was still the same. Uh, students were encouraged just to talk to their professors on a first name basis. It's completely different from how it works at UT where I went to graduate school. Everybody's professor this and professor that. But over here was David, Jeannie. <laughs> and so anyway, but they really took an interest in me as they did, I think, with other students. Now, also, the classes were really small. The only large classes were the intro to psych, intro to cultural anthropology, you know, that I experienced. But uh, my regular classes, I mean, they were like 30 students, even less, 46 students, that was a big class. <laughs> and so um, we had a lot of attention from the faculty. They took a sincere interest in uh, my education and I remember in particular working with uh, Ginny Matute Bianchi, who we've seen, Pedro Castillo, um, David Sweet, and David Kilpatrick. Um, those ended up being members of my committees on, um, on the different um, majors that I had. Um, and one of the things that I found so appealing especially David Sweet, I thought, wow, he'd be a wonderful person to work with. And he spoke Spanish and he was married to a Mexican woman and they had kids and everybody just seemed so friendly. Um, so I ended up, I ultimately ended up being um, one of his, he ended up being my mentor. Um, so I felt like I had a quality education and I did not expect that. I, you know, I didn't know what to expect out of college. It was my first experience. Um, the reason I could make a good comparison later was because I went to the University of Texas, which had over 50,000 students. I, I would have died. <laughs> I don't think I would have survived. So it was actually my dream to come back and teach at Santa Cruz. I thought that would be a wonderful place. I think I could, I like the, the, the emphasis on teaching, quality teaching, and the personal attention to students. That, I just thought that was fantastic. So I, I really benefited a lot. 
Um, the other thing is that um, all of the students that were recruited, or many of the students that were recruited um, in my um, time there, um, were coming from working class families, from other communities, and we all shared this vision of going back to our communities and providing service. And we really did it. I mean, I can look around at my peers and I'm still friends with them. You know, they became lawyers, they became doctors, they became um, public defenders. I mean, they just did the whole gamut and a lot of it oriented toward working the, with communities. And I think that was sort of the vibe on campus anyway. We were, you know, it was a very progressive uh, university and it certainly, um, you know, uh, affected us. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about uh, was I talked already a little bit about Los Mexicas and to me, I had never danced. I could not afford to take dance classes. My mom could not afford the time to drive me to a dance studio in Santa Cruz. So it was just an opportunity to dance. But what really caught my attention was the uh, passion that students expressed while they were dancing. They just seemed so happy and they were not all. It wasn't 100% uh, Chicano Latino. We had uh, uh, several Anglo students. In fact, it was an Anglo student that invited me to see him perform. So I didn't know what I was going to see. But that turned out to have a lot of um, influence in how it shaped my career. I did not think I was going to be a university professor. I originally thought elementary. I did not think I was going to be an anthropologist. But I found that that was the sort of the, the, the discipline that accommodated my interest in history and culture. Um, so that was really wonderful, and I think that we've done a lot of wonderful things. I think Los Mexicas is now celebrating the 48th um, reunion. Uh, and in what's interesting about Los Mexicas is that if you look at the alumni list, you will see members of different families, including my own. I had a sister and a brother that dance, and then two nieces that dance later. Now people are grandparents, couples in the, the group got married. I mean, it, it's just this whole, when we say it's like a family, it really is like a family. So that was really wonderful. Um, one of the things about the campus uh, that, you know, always catches people's attention is how beautiful it is. And it was beautiful. Um, this is why my, but there was a reason why my mom was worried about me going to these evening classes. The early 70s was a time when there was serial killers in Santa Cruz. And, um, they, in fact, um, murdered a couple of uh, UCSC students. So it was a, a horrible time. I remember in high school, my senior year, people were saying that Santa Cruz was the capital, the murder capital of the United States. So imagine going through this campus, through the forest. In the daytime, it wasn't so bad, but at nighttime, it was really scary. And so we try to walk in pairs or, you know, with your uh, classmates. And I don't know, Herman, maybe you can say something. I remember mounted police. I remember seeing mounted police go through the trails. And I don't know if that was, uh, and, but I just had that vision. So I don't know if they actually decided, well, you know, you can only take the patrol college so far and the horses can go through all these um, uh, trails. Uh, but that was um, what I remember. And I think I'm going to end and let uh, Herman speak. Oh, but I did have the occasion, I should say, to meet Herman uh, when he was the Provost of Oaks. I focused on um, history. I was doing work on uh, Blacks of the, in the Americas. And I guess that's why I went to go see Herman. I don't know if he was teaching that class. But um, anyway, I do remember having the opportunity to, to visit with him. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Olga. For those profound words. Um, and then uh, uh, Herman, um, if you'd like to offer your comment, please. Well, thank you, Olga, for that uh, nice uh, commentary. Uh, I'm tempted to try and respond to some of the kinds of issues you raised, but I prepared a paper because I wanted to make sure certain thoughts got expressed. And maybe in a discussion, we could talk more back and forth. But I was moved by your presentation and very much appreciate your comments. I came to Santa Cruz in 1966 and left in 1984. 
Those years left an indelible impact that shaped my entire professional career. Yet, I did not travel that road alone. Therefore, I want to de dedicate my presentation now to the memory of six precious souls who guided me during those years. From the depths of my heart, these remarks are a memorial tribute to Ralph Guzman, Eloise Smith, Jane McHenry, Gwendolyn Cox Doyle, Josie King, and Septima Poinsett Clark. Now our hosts, Irene, Cameron, and Sarah, have assembled two volumes of oral histories, which they have entitled Seeds, Reflecting Campus Origins and Constant Growth. As I reviewed those volumes, I felt that within and beyond the seeds of origins, I was hearing voices who spoke eloquently and earnestly about this city on a hill, as Olga just did. Yet listening to the voices presented here in these readings made me long to hear even more voices like the seeds that continue growing and expanding, these volumes that you have prepared for us imply there will be more voices, louder voices, and more diverse and multicultural voices. So our editors and the university have created a thirst for more seeds and more voices, and we will expect more you have an opportunity that is as expansive as that view over the great meadow. There are no limits to what the three of you can do, and we expect more of you. Now I'd like to share a few thoughts prompted by what you have read in your first section. Septima points at Clark, and you had a beautiful photo of her with some Santa Cruz students. Mrs. Clark spent two one-month periods on campus interacting with students, faculty, and the general community. She was an extraordinary resource because of her professional as well as her personal life. Personally, her father had been enslaved in South Carolina on the plantation of Joel Poinsett the man for whom the Christmas plant is named. For all of his adult life, Septima's father received a pension for his efforts in the Civil War. Mrs. Clark taught him to write so he could sign his name on his checks in checks. In her professional work, Mrs. Clark was a major influence in the development of Rosa Parks, the civil rights pioneer. Finally, Mrs. Clark became an advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King and was among the group who accompanied him to Sweden to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. My point is, Santa Cruz students interacted with one of the few people who could personally speak of the experiences of Black Americans in that entire century spanning the period from slavery to freedom. She was a rare and extraordinary resource to the entire campus, and I wanted her to be more than a name in your reading. The student voices in these readings are eloquent and persuasive. They felt the need for change, even when they were unable to fully articulate the reasons for their discomfort on campus. When I joined the faculty in 1966, there were only two black students on campus, a female from San Jose and a male from Los Angeles. The three of us would communicate with each other without saying a word because of the unique processes of soul folks enduring stress 
in a strange world. As faculty, we expected students to listen to us, but we seldom listened to the students. I remember a college provost telling Ralph and me that in their particular college, everybody shared a common culture and naturally understood each other. The implication of that remark was that newcomers would be expected to adapt themselves to the culture of the college. In other words, diverse faculty and students would have to become alienated from themselves. I think this alienation was what Glenn, Evelyn, and Michael were feeling in the expressions that you read. As student diversity increased, Ralph Guzman and I talked with them extensively. Sometimes the conversations would become intense, filled with anxiety. We wanted the students to excel in their courses and we stressed academic issues. But so often, the students wanted the university to incorporate their views and their perspectives that they brought from their unique communities. We had to learn to listen to students. Student voices helped shape the design of Oaks College, particularly the apartments with a full kitchen and two bathrooms. Elsewhere on campus, third world students organized cultural programs that broadened the foundations of the city on a hill. In one college, a black student with confidence and eloquence challenged the faculty about their criteria for judging a contest about a personal, about a collection of personal books. The faculty shamefully admitted their rules focus on the appearance of the books rather than their contents. The student challenged them on this issue and they changed the rules. With only about 25 black students on campus, they still organized a successful gospel choir. But because of a shortage of black males, the entire tennis section was made up of white males, but they learned how to sway properly. Students of color did a lot to bring changes to Santa Cruz, and I hope they will share more of their experiences with those of you organizing these discussions. Our readings also include excerpts from Valerie Simmons, Donald Rothman, and Diane Lewis, faculty members at Oates. Each of them impacted my leadership in memorable ways. Valerie was the inspiration for weekly fa faculty gatherings in the hour before the required Oaks College course convened. Valerie reminded us that in requiring the course of students, we also required it of ourselves thus beginning weekly meetings that were memorable as well as productive. Diane Lewis was a profound model of the teacher scholar many of us sought to be. As an African-American woman with deep roots in the black community, Dr. Lewis skillfully balanced multiple perspectives on scholarship while simultaneously motivating students toward higher levels of academic achievement. As you reflect and remember her comments, you should be aware that because of her scholarship and publications, Diane Lewis was the first African-American woman appointed to full professor in the entire University of California system she brought a major change to that city on a hill. Donald Rothman. Donald manifested wisdom in unique and extraordinary ways. He had such confidence in himself that he would write long reflections about his failures as well as his successes in his scholarship and teaching. 
Then he would share the essays with the entire faculty. Don knew how to listen to student voices. And until my requirement, until my retirement, I continued to use the examples he taught me in my academic leadership. Even though I left Santa Cruz in 1984, UC Santa Cruz has never left me. I have been invited to return on several occasions. I always look forward to reuniting with Richard Vasquez, another contributor to these readings. Richard challenges us with his question, what are you going to do to make this a better society, a better country to live in? Not only did Richard Vasquez bring change to the city on the hill, he lives the change he inspires in us. In closing, I want to make a few acknowledgments. While I am grateful to many, there are a few I must thank. There are three of my children, Vanessa, Lyle, and Audris. They bore the burden and the heat of the day, as the folk would say, or during the years of my campus efforts. They never complained, and their support helped to bring change to, to the city on a hill. I say thank you to my devoted wife, Dr. Emily L. Moore, a friend, colleague, collaborator, and tireless supporter. Then there is Dr. William Bill Doyle, who made the dreams of many students a reality. Bill Doyle is a gentle soul and an awesome intellectual giant in changing the city on a hill. <coughs> there is Hal Hyde, a loyal supporter who always showed up when we needed him. Then there are Josie King and Juventino Esparza, whose spirits live on in the lives of many successful students. There are Gwen Lacey, Mary Joan Rodriguez, Laurel Burton, and Raymond Charlin, always loyal supporters. There is Katya. Thomas. Finally, I am forever grateful to Robert Bosler and Ronald Softly. The changes we see today are the changes we brought to the city on a hill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman. Um, thank you so much to both of you. I both I wish you could both hear the applause that I'm sure is scattered across the country right now in various people's offices and living rooms. Um, and just to offer a, a quick response in a unifying theme to what you both said, I think you both spoke so deeply and so personally about how to make a home, you know, and, you know, and I think that what you both have worked on building at Santa Cruz has lasted. Uh, it has changed with different hands at the tiller. And indeed, we are now in a time of, of sea change, but the home that you have built is still being expanded and is a part of that story of the changing city on the hill. So I just want to thank you both for that. Um, and we have some questions uh, from folks um, out there uh, in the world. Um, the first one, uh, let's see, we're going to do this. Um, Olga, I'm going to pose this to you. Um, it's, uh, it says the following. Uh, Dolores Huerta recruited me into the UFW from UCSC in 1976. After working in real struggles with real people, I hesitated to go back to the purely academic world the city on a hill. The only reason I returned was the community studies major, which combined the academic and real world of activism. This has guided my career since then. What exists currently at UCSC to continue this tradition of combining the academic and activist world, 
worlds. And so Olga, I would direct that to you since you talked about tracing some of your own journeys, bridging community and, and, and university, um, and then you know, your own uh, involvement with UCSC uh, through the years up to the present. So uh, yeah, so I'll pose the question to you. Well, currently, I don't know exactly what uh, UCSC is doing in terms of um, connecting with the community. I know community studies was a very popular major and people were very upset when they uh, did away with it. Um, I think that there are lots of student organizations that do exist uh, besides Los Mexicas, you know, uh, Rainbow Theater. I, I can't even think of all the ones that uh, the student groups and they often do a lot of work trying to reach out to the community and to um, provide resources, um, whatever. And, and most importantly, the linkages uh, to campus, uh, opening it up a little bit more. Um, but I don't really know of anything done through the academic departments, to be honest. And. Uh well, I will just say one more thing. When we um, established the, the um, Chicano Latino Research Center um, back in the 90s, we're a different decade, but the time I came back as a faculty member, there was a, um, a good amount of, of faculty of color, uh, particularly women. And uh, under the guidance of uh, Norma Clan, who was a professor in literature, and Pedro Castillo, who was a historian, we organized this research center. And the goal was really to bring a lot of faculty together and graduate students and even undergraduate students who had an interest in uh, cross-border studies in, in um, the Americas, really, uh, Mexico, South America, and the US. Um, and anyway, we, we did do a lot of events where we would invite faculty, I mean, excuse me, the community to come to our conferences, to events that we sponsored. We were extremely active and we did some publications. And I think even though uh, it wasn't, um, you know, for sending students out necessarily, it was a place that people could do that. Um, and the mentors, you know, there like Pat Savea was doing work in the community and when she, worked with her undergraduates, you know, they helped with her, John Borrego the same, um, and the same with me, you know, I was doing my work on Mexican Rodia. I had undergraduate students that I would, that would accompany me uh, to do my work. And so they would get their sort of hands on. So that was another, uh, a different, but a, a really good angle, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is gonna be for uh, you, Herman. Uh, so the question is, uh, what were the most challenging aspects of committing to creating an inclusive and supportive community for students from marginalized backgrounds at Oaks College? It's quite easy, after all, to allow students from disadvantaged backgrounds to enter the school, but it's much harder to actually support and encourage their full and complete engagement at the university. What sort of things needed to be implemented to make implemented to make that safe multicultural community? Well, I would say first of all, among the many things that must be done, it is important that the institution, in a holistic manner, makes a commitment to the success of those students. People talk about these students as if they came in unable to succeed. There was this general gestalt that if you were third world, as, as uh, one of our commentators made in the readings, they just expected you to be inadequate. But that was not the case. Uh, and so in answering to your question, it seems to me there's got to be an institutional commitment and secondly, I would say, trying to speak quickly, there really needs to be a diverse, committed, sensitive faculty who have the resources and the freedom to support those students. 
I remember we had four uh, Latinos on the biology board of studies, four Latinos, plus one or two others doing research in that administration. Our students, minority students, went to medical school. Now that faculty figured ways to make it possible for the students to succeed. And I don't wanna go into all the detail, but what I'm saying is we supported creativity among faculty. And it was not just minority faculty, it was sensitive faculty because Bill Doyle gave us our science program, which had extraordinary consequences. So, you know, I, 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 I think that many of these kinds of issues are there and can be rooted in that system, but the system can't be intransigent and rigid with respect to the needs and the desires of the faculty. Um, so this next question was originally uh, addressed to Herman from Patrick Walker in Singapore. Uh, but uh, I thought that actually I would ask this question of both Olga and, and uh, Herman in that order. And the question is, in hindsight, do you have a major single regret regarding your time in UC Santa Cruz? In contrast, is there a memory about which you are most proud? And Olga, if you could take that first, then we'll move well, to Well, thank you. Um, I actually don't have any regrets, surprisingly, because I, as I said, I kind of went unwillingly in a way. Uh, I, it turned out to be uh, really wonderful. Uh, my, maybe my only regret was not understanding the importance of living on campus because you really bond with other students. And I was commuting back and forth to my hometown. And all of the students that were living on campus, you know, they were forming their own strong bonds and it was a whole different rhythm of life that you have to do as a student, including I really did take seriously study groups. And so, you know, a lot of times that was like at nine o'clock at night. That didn't go over so well the first year. Uh, I eventually moved out of my mom's house. <clears throat> but anyway, that would be my single regret. So when my brother was entering UCSE, I told him, you need to live on campus. <laughs> you got to start there. And so there were good reasons why that, that was important in terms of making a transition. Uh, my, um, you asked me what accomplishments while I was there as a student. Particularly well, proud I, moment, yeah. Well, I was proud that I ended up with a double major, not, with, not intending to be a double major. I had to do education because I wanted my teaching credential, but it didn't count as a major. So I then um, decided Latin American studies, which was a program at the time, I will do that because I can take a little bit of, uh, of some courses like in literature, some in history, some in music, you know, whatever. I could take a range and that was very appealing. But as I said, I was so taken with David Sweet and I took every course he offered. And um, I remember my senior year, they called me and said, Olga, history, you have not <laughs> declared your major and you're, you're almost graduating. I said, I, I do have a major, I'm not in American studies. Said, well, no, you almost finished the, uh, oh, I took a American studies, American history class with John DeZikas, which I absolutely love. And every time I saw him on campus, I remind him. And he says, oh, tell me again. I love to hear your story. He was a wonderful lecturer. But anyway, uh, so the university, uh, the Department of History called me and said I had not fulfilled, I had not done the application for a history major. And I said, I'm not a history major. They said, well, guess what? You've done all the classes. <laughs> all you have to do, you fulfilled all the class requirements. All you have to do is either an oral history, uh, an oral um, exam, or you could write a thesis. I said, well, I'm already doing both an oral and a thesis for Latin American studies. So I did the oral. So I was really proud of myself. I thought, here I go. I was so enthusiastic about the classes uh, that, you know, I did, did two majors without trying. <laughs> so that was wonderful. And wonderful that somebody would tell me, hey, guess what? <laughs> yeah, so Herman. Oh, Herman, I was going to say, I do remember at a meeting, I think it was, when uh, we were meeting at the Oaks Provost House, already as faculty, and I don't know why, we, what we were celebrating, 
except there were all the faculty, um, Chicano Latino faculty there, including Frank Talamantes and Carolyn. I don't really remember why we were there, but they were reminiscing about how uh, the faculty were at Oaks when uh, they came on board. And this was like Carolyn Martin Shaw. Uh, I can't even remember who else was there, but they were just thinking, they said it was so different. It was really lovely and we were very experimental and they did have a lot of creativity from the way they described it. So I think that added a lot to the uh, richness of Oaks. I mean, people were in there with their souls. It wasn't like we have an academic job to do. And I think that was really important. Well, one of the things that was so important was we were able to raise the money through grants and gifts to provide a lot more support for the faculty. Mm. In the first two or three years that Oaks existed, we were able to give summer salary support wow. to every one of our untenured faculty members so that they could pursue more of their scholarship and research we were able to use resources to bring faculty and students together in uh, various settings. The point was to create a constant community of encouragement and support. Mm -hmm. Now, when Patrick, whom I love, even if he's in Singapore, but we stay in touch. When Patrick asked, what did I regret? There was one thing that was very, very significant as I reflected on the years. And that is that in order to make sure we got good minority faculty, we probably in, uh, appointed too many minority faculty and non-minority faculty to acting positions before they completed their dissertations. Mm. When they arrived, they had to complete their doctoral dissertations within two years or they couldn't continue. So they spent two years teaching, participating in meetings, but also doubling down on doctoral dissertations. And then when they finished the dissertation, they had one year before they had the three year review. So that was a constant uh, pressure we did things to relieve the pressure, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but they were extraordinary, and we had wonderful support from a lot of good people. When I think of success, you know, you just have to go completely across the board. From Martin, Martin, who came in under difficult circumstances, who ended up going to Harvard Medical School, to so many others who like uh, uh, Cheryl uh, Scott, who ended up going, not only going to medical school, but ultimately to Tanzania, where for 10 years she ran the uh, American funded program in HIV AIDS. Mm. And she's still an enthusiastic supporter of UC Santa Cruz. Those student lives meant a lot. And finally, appointing Diane Lewis, as full professor, without apology, without having to do anything special. And then when she was appointed full professor, we said she had to get on the committee of committees of the academic senate. We weren't ready to have them use us as tokens on you know, minority committees or affirmative action or anything like that. Let us get to the points of power was great. Thank you both. Um, so uh, right now we're going to take uh, questions uh, until 15 minutes past the hour. So a little bit less than another 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll wrap up at 15 past because this is such a um, rich and, and uh, deep conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, as we move in Towards the end, you know, there are a couple of different questions that I'm going to try to pull together for both of you. Um, and we have a couple different questions, uh, you know, which are talking about, you know, the idea of the changing city on the hill, not only then, but now, uh, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement protests currently uh, 
in the United States. Um, and thinking about that long arc of history, uh, you know, that ongoing story of the changing city on a hill. Um, and so I wonder if you could just both share some reflections on that theme, where we've been, where we are, maybe your sense about where we need to go. And I'd really encourage both of you actually just to be in conversation with one another here because I'm you know, really appreciating your, your dialogue between both of you. So I don't know which one of you wants to take that first, but it's just a big frame question that pulls in a lot of queries we're getting. For me? Well, I'll start, and since uh, uh, Olga is thinking, I think that my brief experiences back at Santa Cruz since the time I left. Every time I came, I was just amazed to see those students and faculty in place, women faculty in place, doing and thinking and working on issues that never entered our minds. I was also thrilled to see that the students and the administration and faculty didn't stop thinking about who else should be here. We had no specific program for LBGTQ students when I was there, mm -hmm. but we had many students who came out of that frame of reference. I only hope that we created a situation where they were welcome and comfortable. I got some feedback that indicated they were even when they didn't come out. Yeah. So that was one. And to see more involvement of others was great. I would speak to the work of an Eduardo Carrillo. Mm -hmm. Eduardo didn't fit anybody's mold, but we were able to bring him on board and he was, I mean, his impact on the community and on the campus was extraordinary. And in many respects, I think, and I'm not trying to articulate and explain it, but my information indicates he was a major force in establishing the Latino and Chicano arts movement in this country. But we found Eduardo Carrillo and brought him in in unique ways. It didn't fit what those people on the faculty and administration thought should be. My final comment, Dean McHenry, through Hal Hyde and Bob Bosla, as well as directly, gave us un, 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 support that was unending. <coughs> what he used to say was, I don't understand what you're doing. And I may not agree, but if you're gonna fail, you're not gonna fail because I didn't support you. And he would give that support. He'd force or make decisions others didn't like in order to make it possible for us. So you got to have allies and friends in lots of places, and they were. I don't know what the situation is now. I cannot speak to it and would not try to. Herman, I wanted to um, say something about didn't fit because I think that's how a lot of us feel, at least um, faculty. You know, we just didn't quite fit into the conventional idea. Uh, and a really good example, um, I, I mean, I think she definitely fit, but for example, Diane Lewis, uh, she was teaching when I was first hired. But I remember I was putting together a reader on uh, the whole notion of um, minorities talking back to anthropology and uh, uncovering the biases that were in a lot of the writings. And Diane Lewis was one of the persons who was writing about this back in the 60s. It wasn't something that emerged in the 80s, which is sort of um, the highlight of the time, but uh, Diane was way ahead of it. And she was talking about, you know, how minorities were silenced. I can't even remember what the 
uh, title of her article was, but it made an impact and I thought, wow, this woman had it together early on, you know, so I think that's really important. And then as far as Edward Carrillo, I was not an art major, but he certainly made an impact around this community. He had a lot of students that were muralists, for example, and they painted up Watsonville, you know, they did a lot of beautiful um, installations and, and murals. And I remember uh, every time there was some inauguration, um, it was like a big celebration. So Mexicas would go out, even if we had to dance on the street, didn't matter. We would go and support the, uh, the uh, projects that the, his students had done. And then I remember at one point, still, um, I think I was still a student, there was the Academia de Arte Chicano de Aztlán in Watsonville, which was a collective of um, artists, and each of us had a specialization, and we went out to the local community schools, and we also taught in the building, uh, but we went out, and in my case, I was in dance, so I went out to Rolling Hills, to, you know, different schools, and offered classes, and his, um, some uh, Eduardo students that were muralists, went and painted schools, you know, with a beautiful mural. I don't know if they're still there. I haven't visited the schools that they were working at. But it was definitely like a big presence. And to me, that, that gave me hope, you know, made me feel like I did actually fit, even though, you know, I wasn't quite the cookie cutter faculty member, you know, brown skin, you know, the studies that I was interested in. Um, but it was those kinds of, of uh, examples, uh, those, uh, pioneers, if you will, that, you know, opened the door, you know, and said, look, we can do it this way. And it doesn't have to be like that. You're in there and you're just equally, ha should have a voice. And, you know, um, anyway, I thought that was very, very important to me. Wonderful. And I think we have time for one last question, Cameron. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, uh, so first of all, both of, you know, you should know our commentators that, you know, there's a lot of tributes kind of pouring in. And so there's a lot of love on uh, the Q&A right now. Um, but I just wanted to read out this one quote and then um, give a little spin. Um, so uh, we've had one person who wrote in saying, um, I feel like the core, the core class curriculum at Merrill and classes like literature of the third world really prepared my mind for the tumult of our current racial and class struggles. I'm very grateful for that information and that I was young enough to receive it as a part of my intellectual and humanistic growth. And, you know, and then this is just me sort of pivoting from that. But I think, um, you know, this is a time where a lot of people are rethinking their libraries, their bibliographies, uh, you know, who, you know, who they're, they're looking to for leadership. But I wonder if both of, of you two could just close us out um, by uh, just briefly naming or discussing a book or a thinker or a school of thought uh, or even just a saying or a maxim, you know, something that has that is, that is popped back into your consciousness recently for the road ahead. For me, it would depend on who is the person who is going to read? Because in my signature course, where I required the students to read 15 books, I was wanting to have such a variety of readings that every student would not only find an intellectual, but a personal connection and become more deeply engaged. So I, I don't think in terms of a book, I think in terms of a whole panoply. And we developed some wonderful librarians at the undergraduate level at Santa Cruz who had wonderful careers. And I would just have to say, get more people like this doing what they do and looking at students and looking at individuals and helping them reach their goals. One book is not enough. A library is. Well, I have two comments. I, I, I don't know why I can't remember the name of the book, but I did take a course with Art Pro on education. And he had this wonderful book and he talked about, um, you know, entering the, the field of teaching. And I remember this one little piece. 
and it was about power. And he said something like, you need to know the structures of power. It's not always where you think it is. And his example was, if you are working at a school and you lock yourself out of your room, your classroom for some reason, do you go to the principal? Where, where do you go for help? And he goes, the janitors. They have a key to every um, room available. Don't underestimate them because of their post as janitors. They have a lot of power and you have to learn how to work with it. Anyway, I thought that was you know, a really interesting um, point that he made. Uh, the book was, was really important. I still have it, but I can't remember the title. I want to say something like education for a livable world, but I'm not positive. Anyway, the other thing that I think was really interesting, and it's no longer there, but when I was a student, we had the Third World Resource uh, Teaching Center. And this was a place where students uh, who were doing projects with communities or, or whatever, um, they would put them in, house them in that place. And that the materials in that place were available to everybody, including school teachers or people not at UCSC. And I remember um, there was an art um, project that somebody did and it was called Pinoy Know Yourself. It was done by uh, a Filipino, I don't know if it was um, more than one person, but it was really interesting and just sort of giving us the lived experience and, uh, through photographs of Filipino communities. Um, I actually did a project uh, as part of my senior work on folklorico because I was trying to share what I was learning with local teachers. And in fact, <laughs> it's a funny story. When I came back and I, well, the Third World Teaching Center was still there when I came back. My, my, somebody had taken my project. And so I didn't have it. I didn't have enough money back then to make the duplicates of everything. Um, but it was definitely being used and, and uh, was really interesting. Somebody actually returned it to me years later. So I actually got it back. But it was a really wonderful uh, center. And that was where if you wanted to add to what was available in uh, the general libraries, this was a place of getting sort of the, as David Sweet would call it, people's history, people's stories, and put that in and, and make it available sort of as um, hearing from often marginalized voices in communities. So that was a, an important part of UCSC, I think. Fantastic. Um, so we've come to the end of our time together and I just like to ask for a, a, a big uh, virtual round of applause for our, our commentators. It's not the same as live, but I'm sure they're applauding out there. Um, and just on behalf of, you know, um, our SEEDS team, you know, everyone in university relations involved in this, thank you everyone for coming out. Um, special gratitude for our commentators. I think at, at the end there, you know, Olga, what you were sort of highlighting was, you know, if you're going to go on this journey, it's the first step, thinking about power. Then Herman was talking about, you know, the destination, right? And that reminds me of something else you told me, Herman, which was that you need the hedgehog and the fox. At the same time, you need to know one thing and many things and wide and broad at the same time. And so I think that was exactly the intersection that both of you two uh, sort of ended at the end there. So I want to thank you both for taking us there and the hundreds of people who tuned in. Uh, so uh, please well, I did tune want to make one comment. Um, for those of you who have not seen the Seeds book, it's really interesting because I really like the original way that you told the stories by getting pieces of a conversation from other pieces of quotes from the uh, larger uh, oral history uh, on each individual and put them into conversation. So that was really wonderful. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, and uh, so we will be back uh, next week at the, at the same time. Our guest commentators next week will be Chancellor Emeritus uh, George Blumenthal, who has appeared in these readings as a professor of astronomy early in his career. Um, and we're also going to have uh, Professor Bill Domhoff, and we're going to be talking about reorganization and a different sort of set of changes in, in the original Santa Cruz vision. So thank you for joining us for this conversation 
on City on the Hill. It's been meaningful. Um, have a lovely night, everyone, and signing off. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye.